And now that we had this really high level person talking to us, we would like to give you more information about the Baltic Sea in general, the history and also regarding the challenges we face currently. We therefore have invited Tobias Etzold, a doctor and a, a expert who has been engaged in the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. He was the expert on Northern Europe there. He's currently working in the Ministry of European Affairs in the Land Schleswig-Holstein. And he will now give a lecture on the challenges of our current Baltic Sea region, but also how we can tackle it and give us some more information about our region. So please welcome on stage Tobias Etzold and listen carefully, have fun and yeah, we'll see each other later. But now, Tobias, it's your turn. Yes, thank you very much, Arlene and Karina, for this invitation to speak to you today and the kind introduction. Well, this is, I think, all quite unusual for, for, for all of us. For me, it certainly is. I think it's my first uh, online lecture I ever did. So I hope it works out well. And well, to start with, I hope you can hear me all well. Um, I wouldn't call this an online lecture. This sounds, to my mind, very, very official and, and, and very boring and, and long. I would rather call it an input from the from an acad more academic perspective. And indeed, as uh, Aline already said, I will talk you a bit through the current, the old and the new challenges of the, the Baltic Sea region is uh, is facing. It certainly always has been facing a number of both internal as well as external challenges. And these challenges have to be addressed by all its countries and stakeholders together. And that's the reason why we have all these different forms of regional cooperation across the Baltic Sea area. There always have been certain changes as well in the region. I think one of the most significant one was the end of the Cold War in the beginning, in the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s. And then again in the mid thousands when you uh, and NATO were enlarged, when the Baltic States and Poland joined these organizations. And uh, these enlargements have certainly fundamentally changed the geopolitical landscape of the region. But then again, also since 2014, as we all know, new geopolitical realities have emerged affecting regional cooperation. And I will go into this in a bit more detail later on. The consequences of the events in 2014 were that between 2014 and 2017, 2018, regional cooperation in the Baltic Sea region took mainly place on a technical and functional level. The political dialogue that has only been revitalized and strengthened in recent years before has been put on hold for some time because it was difficult to still continue it among all the countries of the region because of the growing tensions there. But despite the overall situation we are currently facing, and which is certainly far from normal, we at least are, or the mood in regional cooperation seems to have picked up again in recent years. But I will certainly come back to this in a minute. First of all, I would like to talk you through the various phases of uh, Baltic Sea regional cooperation. And if Aline, you could go back to the to the first slide. Yes, exactly. Thank you, because I'm not so fast. Um, I, I personally find it always quite useful just to, to 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 understand and to see how regional cooperation across the Baltic Sea region has developed and how it went through different phases with different challenges and different difficulties, but also create developments and, uh, and create opportunities. So it all started in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when 
the Berlin Wall came down when the Cold War came to an end, when the Baltic states regained their independence and the Soviet Union collapsed. The most important objective, I would say, in this early phase was to get to know each other because the countries have been, the region has been, has been um, separated for a long time and uh, the countries, and those newly emerged, because they didn't really know a lot about the other countries of the region. So the divide between the region or within the region uh, still has had its repercussions. So I think the focus really was on getting to know each other through political dialogue, but in particular also through people-to-people -people context. And through this dialogue and getting to know each other, it was possible to establish and develop the cooperation, various activities, and also the structures of regional cooperation. And as we all know, many different structures emerged in this time. We always talk a bit about the jigsaw of uh, very different uh, structures. We have intergovernmental organizations, such as the Council of the Baltic Sea States. We have intergovernmental organizations, the Baltic Sea Parliamentary Conference. We have organizations on sub-regional, sub-national, and, and so forth, and also organizations, initiatives, structures that have emerged on a civil society basis. So this was really the first phase where everything emerged, stood up, and uh, where the structures became clearer and, 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 and clearer and where it became clear what actually regional cooperation should do, what it, what it should achieve. Because the challenges, but also the, the opportunities for regional cooperation were already plenty at the, at the, at the time. Environmental degradation was one of the biggest problems already back then and even before. In the second phase, which started about 1996 um, and lasted up until about 2004, um, that phase was marked by the political and economic transition in the member states in the course of the enlargement process and more specific cooperation. And this culminated in the end in EU enlargement in 2004. After that, we have a third phase lasting till about 2009, where a certain stagnation first could be sensed in regional cooperation. Because before, one of the important objectives of regional cooperation, um, cooperation was to bring the countries of the region more or less on one level, enabling the Baltic states and uh, Poland to join the European Union. And now, apart from Russia, all the region, and of course Norway and Iceland, if you also count them to the, to the region, which you politically certainly certainly should, all the countries are in the European Union. Uh, and a lot of things that before have been done on the regional cooperation level could now also be done in the EU. So it was really a task for the structures and for the governments and many other actors to rethink the cooperation. What should it be about now? What is its main purpose? And in that spirit, a certain renewal process of regional corporations and of the various structures started. For example, the Baltic Sea State went through a reform process and at that time became more result, project-oriented, -orient but also revitalized the political dialogue, which was in particular important to involve Russia as a non-EU member state. In the fourth phase between 2009 and 14, the renewed Baltic Sea cooperation was characterized by more practical, specific, and result-oriented work, but also, as I said, a revival of the political dialogue. dialogue. And now we can go to the second slide. In particular, pointing at the inclusion of one, yes, one back of Russia. And in that time also, a certain macro regionalization of regional cooperation took place. But the EU got a stronger role in regional cooperation and the more stable of the region within the wider European context also occurred. And that uh, is in particular expressed through the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, which was adopted in 2000. 
and nine. And indeed, the Baltic Sea region is the first European macro region. I mentioned already before in a, in a, in a fifth phase, new uncertainty and stagnation of regional cooperation in the light of the Ukraine crisis and new tensions in the relations between East and West occurred. New relevance of hard security in the region. The region was very peaceful before, marked by peaceful cooperation. Um, hard security was hardly a matter, but this now seemed to change. Some sort of cooperation was still going on, in particular on the functional and technical level, but the political dialogue uh, was put more or less on hold. But also, again, that changed, and so a sixth phase has started in about 2017, when for a minute the Swift Industries has started to meet again and uh, considered how to revitalize the cooperation, how to keep it up, because more or less everyone was aware that regional cooperation is still very important and useful to tackle the joint problems, challenges, but also to utilize the opportunities the region has to offer. The CBSS, for example, went then through a reform period through which I talk a bit more later on. But again, this region is also marked by new challenges and uh, crisis even, and the current COVID-19 crisis is of course the most prominent example for that which changed a lot. Now coming to the current challenges of which some are new but some are old and we can now change the slides again. We face a certain new east-west divide, I already mentioned that, so there are still tensions between Russia on the one hand and some of the other countries on of the in, in the world sea region on the other hand. It has been moved a bit to, to the background now, other other problems, other challenges are more visible at the moment, but the crisis, unfortunately, has still not gone away completely. Security, I mentioned, uh, there has been a certain securitization or re-securitization of the region. Countries started to spend more in their military, personal and, 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 and uh, equipment as, as well. So countries are kind of preparing for a, for a new military conflict, which of course everybody still hopes that it won't occur. And as I said already, this new situation, this more difficult security situation, had a certain effect on the regional cooperation. And it was really one important task for the different structures of regional cooperation to keep the cooperation up despite the difficulties and despite the tensions in order to tackle the various challenges jointly. As I already said, there are many different structures and sometimes it's a bit difficult to, to discern all of them. Sometimes the Baltic Sea region seems to be a bit of a, of a lettuce soup or jigsaw where many organizations and structures and institutions and initiatives are and sometimes it's uh, hard to know who is Thing, uh, what so it's always a task and that is uh, still the case until today to um, to create good governance and uh, a coherent system of regional cooperation where each of the structures has its place and where the structures can exist along each other and complement each other in their activities Another problem, another challenge is the still existing gaps and disparities among the groups of countries in socio-economic and economic aspect in general. The economic and financial crisis from 2008 onwards has also affected the countries of the Baltic Sea region to a big extent, but all of them actually have managed quite well to, to go through this crisis and to, to reform and also to stabilize their their, econ their economies and then also the kind of in the, in the eastern shore of the Baltic Sea, the Baltic countries, Poland, um, and to a certain extent also Russia have done fairly well, but there's of course still a certain 
gap, for example, in income um, between the countries at the eastern shore and the countries at the western and the, at the southern shore of the Baltic Sea region. As I said already, environmental degradation is still a big problem. There are many efforts to, to, to reduce, for example, the, the, the eutrophication of the Baltic Sea region, but it's a very cumbersome and very slow process. And unfortunately, the Baltic Sea um, still belongs to one of the most polluted seas in, in the world. And then we also have the big challenge of climate change and adaptation and mitigation to climate change. And it certainly has a place, a big role in regional uh, uh, cooperation and the Baltic Sea region is as affected from from the consequences, from the implications of the current uh, climate change as uh, the, uh, many other parts of the of the world. Cross border organized crime, for example, in form of, uh, of, of of trafficking, is still a problem, and there are um, great efforts by different institutions of regional cooperation to to tackle those. A problem which came into the limelight from about 2015 onwards is uh, certainly migration, the big uh, my, my, my migration wave in quotation marks. I know you shouldn't uh, use that word. And that was also affecting all the countries of the, of the Baltic Sea region. And uh, most of the countries um, restricted their, their migration policies and asylum policies and didn't let too many people in. There has been some exchange between the countries, also within the framework of Baltic Sea cooperation, but not really cooperation on that, because uh, every every country more or less wants to wants to handle this uh, autonomously. And now we are in a, in a new situation. We have the COVID nineteen pandemic affecting all. The countries of the region without any exception affecting in one way or the other all of us and this is quite new because of course the climate change also affects all of us but not everyone feels it or can feel it the same way but COVID-19 even if we are all not or if not everyone luckily enough uh, has uh, spot the virus but it's still affecting all of us it affects our daily lives our our mood our modes of uh, working of uh, communicating Without, with each other and uh, cooperating. And certainly also European and regional cooperation in general is affected. It also affects and changes its character and all its areas to some extent can feel it. The last two examples I just gave, migration and COVID-19, also in one way or the other give a certain proof of a recent tendency across Europe and also across the Baltic Sea region to return to a rather national way of handling problems, both politically and administratively. For example, in, in, the, in the context of the, of the migration crisis, um, border controls were reintroduced and now, as we all know, even um, borders were completely close to, to people from, uh, from, from, from other, other countries. And that is mainly decided by the countries themselves and not always uh, very well communicated and coordinated with, uh, with, with, with other countries. So we now see, and we have to hope that it won't last for that long, that uh, national governments take back a bit control and that European international regional institutions are a bit in the back or landed a bit in the back seat, so to speak. To ponder a bit on that, this COVID-19 crisis is indeed a special new challenge. And as I said, it changes at the moment a bit. And I think our on online video conference is a good example for that. It changes the character, at least at the moment, of the regional cooperation, because Regional cooperation around the Baltic Sea has always lived from personal interrelations to face contacts and the possibilities to make new contacts and the personal ex exchange of experiences, views, and best practices, which I think is very, very important. But currently, this is hardly possible, despite this proof improvement of the overall situation in many countries around the sea. And we don't really know how long the situation, as we have it now, will last. Online meeting 
formats are useful, but can only replace a part of the usual personal interaction. Digital skills and resources are often limited and not accessible for everyone. And therefore, they should be expanded in order to use digital use in case the possibility for face-to-face -face contact will stay limited for the time being. But as gaps remain among the countries of the region in terms of digitalization, new efforts should be undertaken to close this gap and to make all parts of societies across the region profit from digital solutions. But despite the possibilities we have now on the digital arena, personal contacts remain important and should be enabled again as soon as possible. And I personally think in the end it will be a balanced and sound combination of both modes of interaction. So both digital and personal, and that will make the difference. I think we don't have to meet each other all the time. I mean, this is also, of course, very good for the for, for, the, for the climate and for the environment if we, if we don't do unnecessary travels. But to some extent, I think it is still important to really have the possibilities to have a face-to-face -face contact. Despite all the negative repercussions at the moment, the crisis can also be perceived as a chance for more cooperation efforts to, uh, for more cooperation and for more cooperative efforts to shape more resilient societies, economies and structures of cooperation that are really able to tackle future challenges and crises, as well as then to develop joint solutions. For example, establishing regional civilian crisis management mechanisms could be a case in point and should be discussed. I also think that close cooperation and the fostered exchange of experiences and best practices is an absolute requirement for mitigating the crisis effects, in particular in heavily hit sectors such as culture and tourism and in order to protect the vulnerable ones of societies. For example, talking about culture, regional institutions should continue to strengthen the cultural actors and networks in the region by facilitating cooperation helping to alleviate the negative impacts of the crisis and to identify new opportunities, for example, new ways of finding an audience for cultural actors. And when it comes to research, it seems even more important that uh, international and regional cooperation in the field of science and research um, takes place. It is really evident that Research institutions from, from, from different countries should do research together, for example, in the medical field, but also in the field of uh, digital solutions. Having talked about all these problems and challenges, I would now talk and uh, also conclude with a few into the future and with some chances, added value and perspectives for regional cooperation. The purpose of Baltic Sea regional cooperation is really to find regional solutions both for regional problems, but also regional solutions for global problems. Because global problems such as climate, COVID-19 and migration, if you want to call it a problem, um, require different solutions. They affect regions, countries in a different way. So you can't treat these problems all the same way, but you have to find specific regional solutions to tackle and to solve or at least to mitigate them. Regional cooperation still offers a smaller framework a smaller number of countries with partly more similar interests than, for example, within a European or wider international setting to tackle the problems where they emerge. The macro-regional approach for example, as expressed in the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, really offers an integrated framework for challenges that are too broad for the national level, but too specific for the EU 27. The transnational problems and challenges cannot be solved, and new chances and opportunities cannot be fully utilized if all of countries of the region do not cooperate with each other in a trustful and constructive way. But, and here comes a very important but, cooperation does not happen automatically. 
regional stakeholders constantly have to work for improving the modes of cooperation and for sound working relations among their institutions as well. International and regional bodies in particular have to constantly adapt to new circle, to new external circumstances and also of course internal circumstances and challenges. And this requires also a certain flexibility and responsiveness by the regional institutions to react adequately and quickly to new challenges and opportunities. And in recent years, as I already briefly mentioned, a reform process has kicked in in several regional organizations around the Baltic Sea, also on the Nordic level. The Nordic Council of Ministers has uh, fostered a reform process to become politically more relevant than the Council of the Baltic Sea states has, uh, has, has done so. And by implementing these reforms, or at least discussing their future, they try to make the organizations and the corporation in general more politically relevant, responsive and flexible. For example, in the CBSS, it has been an important objective to increase relevance, efficiency, transparency and visibility through more focus and flexibility, flexibility in its work, improving the cooperation with other international fora and formats active in the region by fostering coherence and synergies and by avoiding overlap, and to enable concrete results in which the organization is uniquely suited to add value. In the CBSS, um, the, the, the terms of reference and secretariat and of the secretariat have uh, have changed, but one still has to see how these reforms and uh, how the changes in the work mode in a concrete work and cooperation will work out. But from my point of view, it is very important that recently adopted reforms in the CBSS and various other regional institu institutions are put into practice as soon and as effectively as possible. And that cooperation also functions in the future, of course, requires strong will willingness and continuous commitment by all its parties. So they really want to want, have to want this cooperation and really also work for it. Last but not least, last but not least fitting to this uh, event and uh, to you, um, the strong involvement of youth and young persons is required and very important. Several initiatives have been already taken in recent years, for example, the CBSS Ball to Sea Youth Platform. The next step, from my point of view, would be to establish permanent platforms to involve youth on a stable and permanent basis, and which really gives them the possibility to interact with people on other levels, with stakeholders, with politicians, with governments, to exchange and to bring in their ideas, concepts and experiences, which really should be fed into regional cooperation, and by that foster the exchange between various groups of persons and stakeholders. That's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you could all hear me well. I'm sorry that I had to turn my head a couple of times, but I had my presentation on a, on a different uh, screen. So these are a bit the difficulties of this kind of uh, presentations. But uh, I'm looking forward now to your remarks and uh, questions, if there are any. Great. Thank you very much, Tobias. I think that was a really informative overview of our region and how it developed. And yeah, as Tobias already said, please ask questions in the chat. I can see that there are already two of them. So I would first start with the first one. I don't know if you want to answer it or Karina or I should answer that, but I guess you can do that. First, does the Council of the Baltic Sea States have a certain budget of money and where is it coming from? That's a question from Christian. I'm not sure whether I can see the questions. Okay. But, so yeah. feel, feel, feel free to answer them now. Yeah. <laughs> Should I answer like this one? Yeah. It 
it really like to everyone um the budget of the council of the baltic sea states is coming from the ministries of foreign affairs or the federal foreign offices like it's called in germany and it's uh, a certain amount it depending on how big the country is so it it is really a state budget and this is how the council is functioning but now also a lot of projects are there like for example our Baltic Sea Youth Platform. So they, of course, add to the whole budget of the Council of the Baltic Sea State, especially the Secretariat. But there is much more to it. Like we can hold a whole lecture on the Council of the Baltic Sea States and what it actually entails. We will do a short presentation tomorrow. So if there are still questions, please ask them tomorrow. But then, yeah, okay. Then, Tobias, we have one more question. Cooperate ration in which spheres has remained the most resilient after 2014? How, no, how... indeed, I can indeed see the see the questions. Yes, <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good uh, question. Um, I already mentioned that uh, the cooperation was 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 going on and didn't stop uh, com, com completely luckily enough. So it was it was mainly the, the, the political cooperation or the political dialogue that that has been put on hold for, for for some time at least on a very on, on on higher levels i mean the foreign ministers and the prime ministers they didn't meet for a number of years so ministerial meetings didn't uh, take place but uh, but the, the government officials the representatives of the of the foreign ministries in the so called uh, officials they they still met on a very regular basis and they're always uh, discussing the, the the cooperation and the and the and the problems and so forth and in the many other forms and, and structures cooperation continued and i would say it was probably most resilient because probably most needed in the field of uh, of, of environment um helcom continued its uh, its, 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 its activities in particular within the framework of the Baltic sea action plan i mean there is a lot to do so one, one can't really afford to stop the activities and there and uh, also in other areas such as uh, safe uh, safety and uh, security um trafficking and so forth the, the the cooperation at least to my mind seemed to be to be uh, quite resilient and uh, I, I think also on the on the people to people contacts level um at, at least there were attempts to, to continue to cooperate and to not let them affect them by the by the tensions and the problems on the on the highest uh, political level. I see another question here. Can you estimate influence of the northern dimension on reach operation. Yes. Exactly. Um, I try to answer that. Uh, indeed, I didn't. I didn't mention the northern the, the north dimension, and uh, that it's possibly because it's at least to my mind uh, not that relevant uh, anymore. It, at least it doesn't seem to be that uh, relevant anymore. I think it was it was very relevant in the 1990s and uh, 2000s. It was a Finnish initiative, and it was actually one of the of the first moves of the European Union into the region and the northern dimension did not just cover or did not just deal with the baltic sea region but had a much wider focus it was really northern europe in general and, uh, and even even reached into the barrens and the arctic uh, areas uh, so so yeah baltic sea region is has been just one part of it they have been to the northern dimensions um, after EU enlargement, um, it at the time has been become more, it become more focused, and I think the most important expressions of the northern dimension were always its four partnership partnerships in environment, uh, social well-being, and health, um, transport and infrastructure, and uh, and culture. But uh, while all these partnerships still exist and the Northern Dimension policy as such still, still exists, I personally, but there may be others who know more, but I don't know much about how it's going at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the moment and what it, uh, what it uh, really does. I know that the, that the Northern Dimension Health Partnership is still quite active 
And uh, I mean, there, there is of course a bit, sometimes a bit this confusion because they also play a part in the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region. So the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, which is perhaps a bit more now the name of the game since uh, 2010, and, uh, and, and I, I would say has more relevance, has more importance for the Baltic Sea region as such than, than the northern dimension. Um, but, but it kind of uh, interrelates to one, one way or the other. Yeah, I think I can shortly add something from our field of working, for example, a youth field. We work really closely with the Northern Dimension Partnership on Culture, also in the youth field. And the culture sphere of the CBSS is also really close to the Northern Dimension and then to the policy area of culture. So there are often you meet the same actors there. And that's also really good because then you can really build up synergies there. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. It's a great thing to do, and it shows that our region is really collaborating and coming together as one, which, yeah. of course, from a regional identity point of view, that's great. Um, so we have one more question by Karina, actually. Do you think that closing the borders during the pandemic will affect the Baltic Sea cooperation in the long run? Mm, that's it. That's Good question, not so easy to answer, I would uh, say. I mean, um, apparently, at the moment, we are we, we, we seem to be in a situation that, uh, that at least some borders are, are opening again, not not uh, to, to, all, to all to all countries. But of course, this is this is the this is the, the idea and uh, to, to, to open them as soon as it is uh, as it is possible again. But then, of course, we don't know how the situation will develop and whether there will be a point in time where some countries at least think that uh, that the borders have to be closed again while i mean many experts actually say that it doesn't make much difference and uh, i heard one i think it was the foreign minister of of, of, of luxembourg saying that uh, that the virus can can go from person to person but not from country to country and um so i mean it can be in a country as far as it can be between countries, and uh, so I mean, yeah, this is a very, very complex and very difficult issue. I would, I, I would say, um, but as we don't really know what the, what the situation will be, let's say in a couple of months, uh, be I think it is hard to to tell at the at, at, at the moment uh, how it will affect uh, Baltic Sea cooperation. But uh, I mean, at the moment we have we, we have to find new ways of uh, cooperating and communicating with each other anyway. So we do most of it uh, digital. I think many events um, have been cancelled and probably would have been cancelled or will be cancelled more because of the of the, of, of the of, of the danger of the, of the of the virus and not so much because because the borders are closed. So yeah, let's let's hope indeed, although I can't really answer or can't really answer this this this, this question this question conclusively but let's hope that that the situation won't won't take too long and that it won't affect the sea cooperation too much okay yeah we hope for the best of course then we have a question a little different from that how do you see the role of russia in the baltic sea cooperation after 2014. this question yeah, was asked by uh, Semyon. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a that's a good um, question. Also, not that easy um, to answer. Um, to start with, I mean, as I as I as I mentioned before, the the relations between between Russia and uh, most of the countries of the region have changed. I mean, they have been strongly affected by the events in Crimea and uh, Ukraine and uh, many countries of the region and many other European countries uh, really see or, or, or perceive the situation that Russia has uh, broken the rules that, that, that it has worked against international law and uh, the relations between, between some of the countries of the region um, with Russia were already difficult before I mean that has a lot to do with the with the past, with the, with the common Soviet past, and uh, uh, the Baltic states, for example, they, they, they really, I mean, it was 
it's important to be as independently as possible from 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 Russia. And but they are very small countries, and uh, Russia still is a very big one. So they 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 still seem to perceive Russia as a as a, as a kind of threat, and this perception has increased after after 2014. And therefore, it was particularly difficult for these smaller countries uh, sharing a border with uh, Russia and also to some extent Poland, but also to perhaps different extents and also for various other reasons uh, for the Nordic country, countries and, uh, and, and Germany to continue in the, in the same fashion and in the same mood with uh, the cooperation with, uh, with, with, with Russia. So again, new ways had to be found to kind of overbridge the political differences. Russia, I mean, the, the Russian, at least as far as I can 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 see it or judge it, was of course different. We didn't see they have done every, anything wrong. So, so uh, from their point of view, the co the cooperation could have continued as it was uh, before. And and sometimes it seemed a bit difficult to understand for them why some of the other countries uh, made a bit of a noise. Now, um, so it was actually a Russian wish, really, to to continue the cooperation in as many as possible um, areas. And uh, overall, they they actually were, at least in some areas, still quite constructive. But uh, of course, the overall situation has uh, has changed. But it seems to me that then also from 2017 on, when again ministerial meetings became uh, possible when the political dialogue re revitalized that uh, Russia certainly was interested in that and also playing uh, constructively in those uh, meeting formats. Thank you very much. I don't yeah. know whether anyone would like to add something on that, but that's just my personal perception. Okay. I think you summed that up really yeah. well. And also we can see that, for example, we also saw it this year in the ministerial and the CBSS. It's often Russia who actually ask for a higher budget of the CBSS and more cooperation now. So they really like this idea of having the Baltic Sea cooperation. And of course, there are others hesitant about it. For example, if you also look at the Council of the Baltic Sea States, it's not called um, a council meeting until this year. They never yeah. called it council meeting. So, like, this is due to. Like yeah. yeah, it's now a ministerial. Like, it's the same, but it's not called a council meeting due to these tensions between Russia and some other states. So, really interesting yeah. to see until today. But, yeah. Great. Then we can move on. Could you give a brief. Just, just yeah. Just one more, just one more addition. I mean, it was very interesting to see that. I mean, it was, uh, as we mentioned before, right, the very first time that this, that this uh, meeting of the foreign ministers uh, took place in a virtual setting as well, and that that made it possible for all the foreign ministers of all the countries to participate, which uh, wasn't the case before when they when they when they met in person. It was actually a very rare, a very rare occasion that all the foreign ministers in person were, were present. They were often replaced by secretaries of state or sometimes even ambassadors. And it was particularly Russia, who, who often, but also Germany, I have to admit, who didn't send their foreign minister, but, uh, but the ambassador or uh, high-level official. Um, yeah, but this time, and I think this is a positive sign, all the foreign ministers in person were present and, uh, and exchanging views and discussing with each other that, and, that, and that shows that perhaps there is a way to new normality in uh, regional cooperation and to also integrate Russia again a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And it, indeed, it never happened before. We looked in the archive, we digged everywhere until 1992. Yeah. It never happened before that all the ministers were present. So that was a great sign. And youth was mentioned so much that we hope yeah. that really the youth yeah. can lead that way and be the part that the clue between these countries to keep them together. So, yeah, great. Then I would ask the next question from Luisa. Yeah. Uh, could you give a brief overview on how work-related migration has been looking during the last years in the Baltic Sea region? Mm, that's a good question, but I have to admit I'm not really an expert on 
on that work, uh, migration throughout uh, the region. Of course, I have seen some 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 reports on on that, and I think there are reports and there are tables how the how the movements are, but I'm not quite sure how this developed in in uh, in recent years. I think what I know is I think there's a, I mean it, it used to be for a long time that in particular people from the eastern shore of the Baltic region on the Baltic countries but also from Poland they moved to, to other countries they moved to countries in the west to Scandinavia to the United Kingdom or to, uh, to Germany I mean, I mean Poles for example moved uh, to work in, uh, in Germany in many Balts uh, work and live in the Nordic uh, countries many Lithuanians, many Latvians live in the in the, in the United Kingdom, but I think that at the moment there is a certain tendency of people going back to the country of origin because the, the, the overall um, working and living conditions and possibilities have have improved there. And uh, I mean, Brexit also certainly plays plays a role there. Many many people who have worked and lived a uh, long time in the UK. They are they are going back, and I know that uh, many people from Lithuania, from Latvia, from from Estonia are returning from from the from the UK, and I know that the governments basically have. Uh, I mean, for, for, it was a problem for those countries and for those governments uh, because the, the population was really shrinking, and they had uh, difficulties to fill uh, uh, vacancy. So the social dem demographic development didn't, uh, and probably still doesn't. Look very good in many countries around the world. Even in, in, in Germany, I think in the, some of the Nordic countries it is a bit uh, better. But uh, there certainly has been, have been reactions, uh, and uh, and and, and, uh, and governments explicitly try to uh, to uh, develop incentives to make people turn to their to their countries of uh, of, of, of origin. So. Unfortunately, I can't give any any concrete figures for that, but but I'm sure there are ways to to look uh, to look them up. All right. Yeah. If you know any ways, of course, we can later on also share that. Um, yeah. If you know some articles or whatever, we can follow up on that. And then we have one more question, and I just want to encourage everyone: you can still ask questions. So if you have one, just right into the chat and we will read them out and we will discuss them. So there is one more from Tatiana. How will the pandemic affect uh, educational exchanges between EU countries and Russia? Do you know anything about that? I'm afraid not. No, that's a very, it's very good. I kind of very good question, but very specific. And uh, this is uh, nothing I'm, I'm dealing with in my, my daily work. Um, but perhaps you know a bit more about that uh, um, from education, uh, educa the education, various education bro uh, programs. Yeah, like I, I can tell us a little bit, at least from the Erasmus program for now, um, everything is virtual. So there won't be exchanges like physical exchanges to Russia yeah. currently, which is really a bummer, I think. Um, also, there are some double degree programs who are not going to happen next autumn. I'm aware of that. And that's also really sad for the ex educational exchange. Um, there are, of course, really big issues. And of course, it's an, yeah, this uh, crisis has shown that uh, educational exchange really need physical exchange. It's not the same if you sit in your room. Yeah. And so that this sector is really, really heavily affected. And I would take like to take this opportunity to really encourage everyone to go out and go and try and exchange, maybe even in the region if you don't want to go too far or somewhere else, because this is really a great way to see the world and experience it. For From my own perspective, I can tell you I went from Germany to Finland and it changed my life and uh, it was really really awesome so it should not stay like this and I'm also doing a double degree in Russia and I know that it's affecting our program but I hope after all of this is over we'll just go back to our old normal and see how it will uh, yeah and see how that it will be okay afterwards and maybe even better so yeah we yeah. have one more question 
maybe somebody in the audience, <laughs> oh, we have, that's well, Karina, maybe somebody in the audience knows something about that. Feel free to comment, feel free to uh, write something in the in the comment chat if you have any experience with Russian and EU exchange and educational exchange. Then, of course, we would be happy to hear about that. Yeah, I, I just I just would like to add on that, that. I mean, this is, of course, also certainly something that does not just affect uh, the educational exchange between Russia and the EU, but, but all, all the EU countries themselves. I mean, this certainly affects the various Erasmus programs and Erasmus exchange, so it might be very, very difficult at the moment for any student from any country to go to another country and to, to study there. So I guess many people have to at least for the time being to give up their uh, their, their their plans and so yeah i mean it, uh, and i mean it, the, the, the crisis affects our national education systems i mean so in many universities the schools are closed it's a very very slow way back uh, to, to to normal or to the new normal so uh, yeah i mean it affects education to a great extent and uh, education certainly has to has to find New, new, new ways, and uh, but yeah, of course, uh, um, for uh, for uh, if you go abroad, I mean, you want to go to abroad. I mean, going online abroad, yeah, that's not that exciting. Um, so I mean, going uh, studying in a in a different country at a different university, I mean, that is only possible actually by by uh, by doing it uh, physically. Physically. So yeah, again, also here, let's hope that uh, that it soon becomes possible again. Yeah, so Ekaterina also said that it will be uh, open, the borders will be open in July for working and studying. I just want to like add on that, uh, yeah, incoming and outgoing, as Luisa says, um, both incoming and outgoing exchanges have been already cancelled, unfortunately, uh, because the universities yeah. were just not like, it was a really uncertain situation. And of course, also, as I've been advocates, advocating a little bit for education also on an EU level, I could tell that we had this discussions on the multi, uh, fi multi years annual um, financial framework. And unfortunately, this also led to the impression that we don't need that much money in exchanges because we can have them online. So if you want to do something really great, advocate for this and go to your universities and talk to them. And yeah, Dimitri is also now sent a CBSS report to Luisa. So Luisa, check it out. And it's uh, actually in CBSS report on security and migration from 2017. So if anybody is interested in work migration in our region, check this out and you'll get more information. And possibly also, if you're interested in that, just ask our colleagues in the CBSS secretariat who compiled this report, they probably have some new figures and you can always get in touch with them. I can promise you those people are really, really nice people and they are happy to help you with any questions if you have ever, ever have one. So that's, yeah, would be, uh, just go ahead. And then we had one more question. How do you think the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, which we will at some point call EUSPSR because it's just shorter, will develop in the next years? What's the biggest challenge for it? Well, that's a very complex question, uh, Karina. Uh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, she knows how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> well, we know each other since a long time, so she knows how to tease me. Um, well, again, um, hard, hard, hard to say. I mean, they are they are now at a moment in the process of uh, of um, developing a new uh, framework, a new how is it called um, uh, strategy paper um, action plan, a new action plan for the for the for the next uh, years. I know from colleagues. That's a very difficult, very cumbersome process with uh, many different different ideas and and expectations towards uh, the this, this strategy. Um, I'm, I'm I'm never quite sure what to say how the strategy has developed. I mean, it kicked off really well. There was a lot of enthusiasm. It seemed uh, to be yeah before the, the new name of the game. Um, every very hoping and even expecting that it makes regional cooperation more efficient, more effective, more project 
focused and result oriented and also creating this this um, very much needed um, better coordination and uh, coherence uh, among actors and uh, within policy areas and uh, activities. But after this first kind of wave of enthusiasm, it, it, it has um, quite quickly actually turned out that, well, it's not that easy and uh, apparently the expectations were, were, were different and yeah, well, the, the hard work started and, and there was a bit of an uncertainty how to, how to uh, develop and uh, what to make of it. I, I still think the strategy is is, is useful and uh, I mean a lot has emerged within the framework of the strategy. There are new projects. Um, it is a way to focus a bit more, to, to cooperate in a more focused way in certain policy areas. I think it also has brought some, some actors closer together, some actors were forced really to cooperate uh, with, each, uh, with each other, which I think is, uh, is positive. Um, and well, again, for the future, I mean, it, it, it seems that the policy areas more or less stay the same. There won't be much change. Apparently the horizontal actions uh, will kind of be integrated into the policy areas. Um, but I'm, I have to look into the document again to, to see how that will work out uh, concretely. Um, what from my point of view is still really needed is uh, is more 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 focus really focusing on a few policy or issue areas i mean at the moment they are still very to focus on projects to focus on on for, for which funding is available which doesn't seem the case for all the, the, the projects that are intended so funding always is a problem and probably will also remain one in the in, in the future and again, yeah, more coordination certainly is um, is, is needed. And apparently, there are there are plans or, or wishes, at least by by some stakeholders, for example, by the national coordinators of the of the different countries in the EU strategy, to establish a contact point which um, takes over some parts of this coordination function. And uh, from my point of view, that sounds reasonable, it might be useful. Some other macro regional strategies, they have that already, for example, the Danube um, strategy. So, well, we shouldn't establish too many new more structures, but if we have perhaps one function which brings different actors more closer together, that could be, could be useful. But it's certainly a long, long way until there. And then another aspect which I think from my point is very important, um, still very important to, to even more involve citizens, civil society, um, actors, NGOs to play a part in the implementation of the strategy or at least individual policy areas and, uh, and projects. So inform them more what is, what is going on. And this just doesn't apply to the Baltic Sea region strategy but to, to all the all the all the strategy will really make it more 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 visible show what the added value is um, to the people because uh, they really should also in a way profit from from this and at the moment if you ask people have you ever heard about the EU strategy for the border sea region they they would say no so this i think is uh, is a challenge that has been has to be tackled in the future Right, maybe a question adding to that. How do you see the role of young people there? Like, do you think that the EU strategy needs much more young voices? Can there be special projects for young people? Or how can they maybe get more involved in this whole strategy and this really technical uh, area of the Baltic Sea region? Yeah. Well, that's that's probably a bit one of the problems of the of the strategy and those the other macro regional strategies that it is actually quite technical and uh, often, well, I think also also for, for for people like 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 me, not always easy to understand uh, what's going on. And if, particularly if we look into the individual policy areas and the horizontal actions and projects, so quite often it seems to be 
yeah, very complex and, um, and then also a bit far from from reality of uh, of life, and only experts can can understand it. So we, yeah, and that that's probably one thing which also should be should be changed. Um, well, how to involve young persons? I'm not sure whether I whether I can uh, can 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 answer that. But but I think in general, yes. Um, I include young persons when I when I say civil society, uh, NGOs, uh, universities should have a stronger role in this, and uh, at, 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 uh, both in in discussing and developing this this, this strategy and uh, make it fit to to the needs. I think uh, young people can play a role really by really saying what what they think is important for regional cooperation, whether it's within the strategy or within other formats, and uh, then also try to get in, involved in concrete projects. And uh, I think there are there are various ways to do you know, by by I, I think I think you are a good example for for, for, for that uh, by contacting stakeholders. Um, yeah. All right. So get active people. That's also something we have to make this whole technical thing a little more youthful. So we have yeah. another question by Nele. I, I know it's not that easy to answer, but maybe you have a bit of an answer to it. What are the collective measures and actions taken against climate change by the CBSS? So as we are not a really active body, what um, oh, yeah, do you have an I answer to enough. that? I probably, probably you or, or Karina might might be better able to 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 to, to answer that. I'm not uh, entirely sure what is exactly going on at the moment. I'm going to say anything wrong. So yeah, we have one um, priority area in our secretariat. It's the priority area sustainable and prosperous region. So if you yeah. want to know more about climate change and how it's tackled in the region, go there. And they also, for example, have. Exactly, Karina is really right. There's a workshop tomorrow by our colleagues from the horizontal action area, action, climate, Valdo Latvi. He is a really great expert on climate issues and he's actually a colleague of ours. He's in the, our secretariat, but also part of the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region as a horizontal action coordinator. So he can tell you everything that was going on within the climate community in the Baltic Sea region. So you should definitely join his workshop tomorrow and ask this question. What I can tell you for now already is that, for example, we have the Baltic 2030 um, unit there as well. So all the actions are, are taken are under the agenda 2030. This one is enhanced much more. And for example, also one of the panelists later on that you will meet Jonas, he's a part of the Regeneration 2030 movement. And that's also something we really support in the uh, CBSS. So from a young perspective, but of course there's a lot more. And yeah, exactly. Karina is also mentioning the Regeneration 2030 people. They are great yeah. people. So you definitely have to listen to them if you want to get active, especially in our region, because they really do a great job in bringing this forward. And it's not only about climate change, but really about the whole Agenda 2030, which is also really important to state. But of course, uh, climate change, we we of course support more local actions in the CBS as in general. So we don't, or at least the secretariat, we are not doing much actions ourselves, but we really support those that are taken and want to bring them up and make them bigger and regional. So that is one of the uh, things we do in the CBSS, at least the secretariat, not talking about the counts in general, yeah. of course. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, is there a more one more question? No, I don't think so. So we can then also um, close this session. So thank you very much, Tobias. I think you covered a lot of topics in a really short time with a really great overview. And I hope everybody understood now what the EUSPs are, the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region is, the CBSS and all these different actors in our region. It's really complicated, but you really covered it greatly. And I'm really thankful to you that uh, you had the time and you came here and talked to all of us and 
you pre yeah you were asked really rather shortly and you jumped in and said yes this is something i want to do and i know that you have done it before and you always do it with a really great enthusiasm so thank you very much and i hope it was really informative to everybody else um 